Good morning, church family. It is a, a joy and a privilege to be standing in the waters of baptism this morning. We have three baptismal candidates who come forward for baptism this morning. I'd like to introduce you first to Riley Caldwell. Riley and I had the opportunity to sit and to talk. Uh, he shared his, his faith story with me. He shared his knowledge of Jesus Christ and his coming to the Lord. Uh, if you're a friend or a family member of Riley, would you please stand and be recognized this morning? Riley, look at all this wonderful support you have here in your baptism. Riley, scripture teaches us that if we believe in our hearts that Jesus died and rose again, and we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, that we will be saved. Riley, what's your confession this morning? Uh, Jesus, is Lord and Savior. Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I'm wonderful. <laughs> Riley, based on that confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. second candidate for baptism this morning is Carolyn Hill. Uh, similarly, I had the opportunity to sit with Carolyn and her mother and, and share her love of Jesus Christ and her knowledge of the scriptures. Uh, you know, when it came up and I was asking Carolyn about her favorite verse of the Bible, she said, you know, I just, I really love the story of Jonah. And that struck me so much because that was the very analogy that our Lord used for his death burial and resurrection would be that as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so he would be in the grave for three days. If you're here to support Carolyn, if you're a friend or a family member, would you please stand for her? Look at the wonderful support you have of all these people who are here to see you be baptized. Carolyn, just like Riley, scripture teaches us that if we believe in our hearts that Jesus died and rose again, we confess with our mouth that he is our Lord, we will be saved. What's your confession this morning? Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I love him down the cross for my sins. Amen, amen, wonderful. Carolyn, based on that profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. candidate this morning is Brian Shepard. Brian comes as a, a new member of our church. He's been in our membership class with uh, his wife Ashley and uh, Brian came and, and had the opportunity to sit down and he and I talked one-on-one -on -one and he just shared his life testimony with me. He shared his background and his history growing up in the church and and some of his struggles with with leaving and walking away from that faith but desiring to come back and walk closely with the Lord now and be baptized. Brian, if you're here today uh, as a friend or a family member of Brian's in support of his baptism, would you please stand? Brian, likewise, scripture teaches us that if we believe in our hearts that Jesus died and rose again, and we confess with our mouth that he is our Lord, we will be saved. What is your confession this morning? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Brian, based on that profession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Will you join me in prayer this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we have seen the witness of these three lives that have been changed by your gospel. Lord, I pray that their lives would touch so many others, that, Lord, our witness would reach out far and wide into our community, that, Lord, this gospel message, it truly does save. 
that we can live in eternity with you in heaven and not be afraid of anything. Lord God, would our message resound in the ears and in the minds of all those who would hear and who would see our changed lives. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Tell me I don't need to start over. There you go. I will start with the last one. Two major events coming up in October. Uh, you may have seen the sign out front, Multiply. That is a major three-day event that we will be holding October 14th, 15th, and 16th. Probably one of the biggest events we've ever done, so we need as many volunteers as we can. Uh, Sign-up sheet on the table in the back of the church. I appreciate if you come out and help with that. One day, two days, all three days, whatever you can do. Uh, I would ask that you all please stand for our call to worship. Call to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 51, and will be delivered by Miranda. Deliver me from the blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my mouth that I may... Declare your praise, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. By your favor you did to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be on, offered on your altar. Let us pray. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for drawing us together and into your house this morning. Lord, thank you for the work that you do in and through each and every one of us especially those who were just baptized this morning, may you be glorified by their profession of faith. May we as a congregation be encouraging and supportive in their walk with you. Lord, we ask that you draw others to yourself and that you would use us as a vessel to accomplish that work. Lord, we ask that you be with Pastor Matt as he delivers your message to us this morning. Give power to your word. Prepare us to receive it. Open our hearts that we may hear, our ears that we may hear in our minds to comprehend it. May our praise and worship be acceptable to you this morning. In Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen.
Let's pray for our offering this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts come to you in worship. We praise you and we glorify you for the baptisms we have witnessed, for the children who lead us in worship now, and, and Lord, for these gifts and offerings that we will present to you as part of our worship. As good stewards of that which you have given to us, Lord, would you receive these gifts back for the furtherance of your kingdom. Multiply them, Lord, so that they might do your work. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Didn't our children do a wonderful job leading us in worship this morning? <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much. Now, children, I do have a little activity sheet for you. Uh, and, and let me explain, as we're handing these out, we've got some activity sheets and some crayons. Uh, on the first Sunday of each month, we observe communion, as is set before us here. We try to schedule our baptisms so that they take place on this first Sunday of the month so that our newly baptized members can partake of their first communion with us here in the church. And one of the things we do, of course, you saw the children lead us in worship. Uh, that's part of our, our monthly ritual and routine here, our liturgy. And each month, the children stay here with us in the service. So instead of releasing them to children's church like we do every other week. We, we keep them here in the service with us. And so part of what I try to do is make my message a little more child-friendly, try to address some of my comments to our children, try to make that interactive for them. And so I've got a little activity sheet for you. And, and children, what I'd like you to do, and, and adults, if you would, we're going to open our scriptures to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We're going to be looking at the section of Scripture that actually begins in Acts 18, verse 23. Those last few verses of chapter 18, and then the whole of chapter 19. Anytime I, I cover a large portion of Scripture like this, of course I can't do justice to the totality of the information that's there. And so I want to ask you to be diligent in your own private study. Go home and read over these, these scriptures, read over these verses and these passages. We're looking at Paul's third missionary journey. Paul's third missionary journey. And I have just a, 
couple of things that I want to point out to you. There's, in fact, about six points in my message today. You'll see the fill in the blanks there on the back of your activity sheet, children. There's a map on the front, and then there's those, those six blanks that you can fill in my, my points. I'm going to make this very easy to grasp. Adults, if you want to look over the shoulders of your children and, and see my little outline there, that's perfectly acceptable. By all means, please do that. Make sure you're following along as well. Jot these things down. I've got a little map here that I'd like to show you, and it's, it's the map that you have there on your activity sheet. And let me pull this up. These two men here that we see are, are Paul and Apollos. And that's the two gentlemen that we're going to be talking about as we discuss Paul's third missionary journey. Paul, of course, the apostle, and Apollos, this man that came from Alexander. Paul's the, the bald-headed guy there. It's, we don't know what Paul really looked like, but we generally believe that he had little hair. Uh, now, go, bring, the, bring the map up here. and I want you to look at this big map. You see this, this little place at the very bottom of the map called Alexandria. Children, can you, all, can you all find that on your map? Do you see where it says Alexandria right there on the very bottom? You got that? Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your crayon. Now, pick a color, whatever color you want. It doesn't matter. I've chosen red. And I'm going to show you where Apollos went on his journey Apollos was from Alexandria, which is down in Egypt. It's right by the, the, the Nile Delta, which is all those rivers that flow out of Egypt and come into the Mediterranean Sea. And Alexandria was the home of a great library, the library at Alexandria. And it was really where all of the world's knowledge was maintained or was contained in the first century, during the Roman Empire, really all of the world's information was, was cataloged and it was kept there at this great library at Alexandria. And this was sort of the seat of great learning was in Alexandria. And so we know a little bit about Apollos from where he lived and where he grew up. And we have some background knowledge and some information that he probably was, was a pretty smart guy. He's probably well-educated coming from this area. Now, if you'll draw a line from Alexandria to, you see where it says Ephesus right there, right in the very middle of your, of your page? Let's bring up that arrow here, the very next slide. It's going to show us from Alexandria to Ephesus. Now, that's where Apollos went to. He probably sailed across the Mediterranean Sea, and he went from Alexandria, from his home, and he went up to Ephesus. And we're not really told in Scripture why he went to Ephesus, other than we know that Apollos was... A Jew. We know that he had converted to Christianity at some point in time. We know that he was educated, Scripture tells us, in the way. The way. This goes all the way back to the Gospel of John when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so people used to call Christianity before they were called Christians, they would call it the way. We remember a, a few months ago we talked about Antioch right before Paul's first missionary journey and it was in the church at Antioch that the Christians were first called Christians but in the past before that from the time of Jesus up until that point they were kind of called the followers of the way and so we know that Apollos was well educated in the way and he went to Ephesus because Ephesus was this central hub of activity es Ephesus was in fact the capital city of Rome in Asia now, that's an important distinction because, of course, the capital of Rome is Rome, right? In Italy. But the capital city of the Roman Empire in Asia, in the continent of Asia, was Ephesus. Ephesus was a major hub of travel and commerce, and everybody went to Ephesus, and all, all the goods that went to Ephesus, and all the people went to Ephesus, and Ephesus was this huge place where everybody kind of congregated together. And so Apollos decided he was going to go to Ephesus and he was going to see what was going on there and he was going to learn about the Christian church in Ephesus. And he spent some time teaching in Ephesus and, and the Bible tells us here that he met a couple of people there in Ephesus. He met a couple of people named Priscilla and Aquila. Now Priscilla and Aquila, remember, if you were here with us last week, they were tent makers and they were... They were uh, uh, compatriots of Paul. They were friends of Paul's. 
And Paul met them in Corinth, right across the sea there, and they traveled over to Ephesus, and when Paul left Ephesus, he left Priscilla and Aquila there. They stayed at the Christian church in Ephesus. And so when Apollos, he came up to Ephesus, he started teaching about the way, and these people, they, they saw that he was well-educated, and they saw that he really knew what he was talking about. He knew the Old Testament scriptures, and he was, he was really smart, but he didn't quite have the full story of Jesus Christ. He didn't quite know the whole message of Jesus Christ. He understood John's baptism of repentance, right? What did we just do this morning, kids? What, we, we watched a baptism, that's right. And you know what? Apollos, he understood baptism, he understood John's baptism of repentance, that we should repent and believe, but he didn't understand the Holy Spirit. He didn't understand who, even what a Holy Spirit was or whether there was a Holy Spirit. And Pris Priscilla and Aquila, they took him aside and they educated him. They gave him even more knowledge because they saw how, how powerful he was and how well-spoken he was and how greatly he knew and understood the Old Testament. So they gave him a little, a little refresher course on Jesus Christ and on his resurrection and on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And you know what Apollos did with that information? He went out and he started to refute the Jews. He went out and he started to stand before the Jews and he started to teach them mightily, Scripture tells us, that Jesus was the Christ. Now, I want you to draw a line again here. We're going to go to our, our second stop. See, Apollos, he left Ephesus and he went over to Corinth. He decided that he was going to go from Ephesus and he was going to go over to Corinth and he was going to minister to the Christian church there. Now he's got all this information. He's got, he's got this better knowledge of the way. He's got this better uh, knowledge of Jesus Christ and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he took that information and he went over to Corinth. And in fact, Priscilla and Aquila, who were well known in Corinth, who lived in Corinth, who helped Paul found the Christian church in Corinth, Priscilla and Aquila wrote him a letter. They wrote him a recommendation letter, and they said, you know, to the Christian church there, they said, please receive him, please receive Apollos, he's a great and mighty teacher, and we want you to know what he has to teach you there in Corinth. Now, here's the other guy we want to talk about. I want you to change the color of crayon that you're using. Apollos's journey went from Alexandria to Ephesus to Corinth, and now I want you to see Paul's journey. Now again, I chose blue. That's what I'm going to use here on my, on my map. Now, Paul was over in Antioch over here. You guys see where Antioch is there on the right-hand side of your map? You see Antioch? Now, Paul went from Antioch up into Galatia, and he was traveling by foot. He was traveling by land. And then from Galatia, he went sort of over into Laodicea and sort of Asia Minor, and then he went down to Ephesus. And so as Paul was traveling from Antioch, he kind of went up and around the long way to get to Ephesus. And we know from Scripture, from Acts chapter 19, that Paul and Apollos were not in Ephesus at the same time. Apollos had already come to Ephesus and left to go to Corinth. In fact, it tells us that in Acts chapter 19 and verse 1, it says, It happened that while Paul or Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And so Paul had traveled his journey around sort of the long way to come back to Ephesus, but Apollos had already gone to Ephesus and learned from Priscilla and Aquila, and he moved on to Corinth. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, at some point in time, they leave Ephesus, and they go back to Rome. And remember, adults, you probably heard me, or you remember me saying from last week is that it was during Paul's time in Corinth in Acts chapter 18 that he wrote the letter to the Romans and he entrusted that letter to Priscilla and Aquila most likely and it was probably Priscilla and Aquila and Phoebe who took it from Ephesus and traveled back to Rome after Claudius's death when it was safe for them to go back to Rome and so Priscilla and Aquila left. Now we know that there probably was some overlap here because how did Paul learn about Apollos? How did Paul learn who Apollos was? Well, his very good friends Priscilla and Aquila told him. 
And so when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he learned about this man, Apollos, and how strong he was in the gospel and how well-versed he was in the Old Testament and how much he knew coming from Alexandria. And then Priscilla and Aquila, they left, and now Paul spends about three years in Ephesus. Do I have any? Let's see. Who is, let, let's, let's say, okay, how about uh, four years old? Anybody four years old? Do I have any four-year-olds? Five? We've got a four-year-old. We've got a five. Anybody five? Five? Six? We've got a bunch of five-year-olds. Great. Six? Seven? Okay, so, I mean, kind of take your frame of reference. How long have you been alive, right? How long have you lived? Three years is a pretty long amount of time, isn't it? I mean, three years is a, is a pretty good, now, for us old people, three years doesn't seem like that long, but for three years, Paul lived in Ephesus, and he ministered there, and that was the longest period of time that he was in any one place during his three missionary journeys. He never stayed in one place for very long, but he stayed in Ephesus the longest. Now, at some point during his three years, now, switch back to your first crayon, because I want you to see that, you see, Apollos came back. He came back from Corinth to Ephesus. And at this point, Paul and Apollos, they met for the first time. Paul had heard about Apollos from his good friends Priscilla and Aquila, but Apollos came back to Ephesus and he met with Paul and they had an opportunity to talk and they had an opportunity to get to know each other very well. Now for the rest of Paul's journey, he, he would go up into Macedonia and Philippi and Thessalonica and then he would come down to Athens and and eventually on his third missionary journey Paul would get to Corinth but we're really not going to go there this is as much as we're going to cover today now does everybody's map look like mine you guys got that you got all that information all right you know where Paul went you know where Apollos went great now flip it over on the back side because I want you to see these couple of points. And the first thing I want you to see is that God uses his perfect timing. God uses his perfect timing. In Acts chapter 18, verses 23 through 28, we're going to see some of this perfect timing. Now, you might think to yourself, why in the world didn't Apollos and Paul meet at Ephesus to begin with. Why didn't God allow them to meet up in Ephesus? You have these two great giants of the faith, these two men who are going to, to preach to the whole world the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why didn't God allow them to meet up in the first place? Well, God uses his perfect timing. And having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through, Galatia, through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, this is talking about Paul leaving Antioch and going up that, that upward route through Galatia. And it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth. He came from Alexandria. He was an eloquent man. He came to Ephesus. You remember, that's the first line we drew, we drew from Alexandria to Ephesus. And he was mighty in the Scriptures. Now, this passage of Scripture goes on to talk about how he taught accurately and how he spoke well and how Priscilla and Aquila saw him and they took him under their wing and they taught him even more than he already knew about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and about baptism. And then he left in verse 27. And when he wanted to go across to Acacia, over to Corinth, the brethren encouraged him and wrote the, to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. So God's perfect timing worked out exactly the way he wanted it to. God uses his perfect timing. And we often don't understand that perfect timing. We often look at our lives and we say, God, why did this happen? Or why did that have to happen? Or why did you allow this to take place in my life? And we like to look at the bad things. Has anybody ever had anything bad happen to them? Anybody? Yeah. And we like to look at those things and we like to say, God, why did you let this happen? Why did this bad thing happen to me? Now, has anybody ever had anything bad happen to them 
And then years later, you learned that that bad thing was actually a good thing? That it was because of that bad thing that God allowed something else to happen in your life that wouldn't have happened without that? Has anybody had that experience? I've had that experience, right? Where you live through something and you say, man, I cannot understand this. I can't see past it. It's bad. I don't like it. And then you get some years down the road and you look back and you say, wow, God, I'm so glad that that happened because if it had not happened, then I would not have learned that lesson or I wouldn't be where I am today without it. You see, sometimes we can't see past those bad things, but God uses as his perfect timing in his perfect way. And God uses his perfect timing in our lives so that we can see and understand that, you know what, sometimes those bad things, they do happen, and sometimes, and sometimes good things happen. Don't get me wrong, right? We, we have a lot of great, wonderful things that we can glorify God for. <clears throat> the second thing I want you to see children there and you write this in your blank is that God uses whom he chooses so God not only uses his perfect timing but God uses whom he chooses and God chooses us sometimes to use us for different purposes God used Apollos for a very specific reason and God used Paul for a very specific reason and those reasons weren't the same and God used Silas, and God used Timothy, and God used Luke, and God used John Mark, and God used all of these characters that we read of in the Bible, and all of these different people, but he used them all for different reasons, at different times. And for Apollos, he had to come to Ephesus to meet Priscilla and Aquila so that he could get well-educated in Jesus Christ, in Jesus' resurrection, in the Holy Spirit, so that he could take that message over to Corinth. But Paul... Paul needed to come to Ephesus and he needed to stay there for three years and he needed to minister to the church at Ephesus and he needed to, to meet the brethren there and he needed to, to speak and preach about Jesus Christ there at the church at Ephesus. But that wasn't Apollos' mission field. Apollos was meant to go over to Corinth. And God used who he wanted to use to achieve those goals. <clears throat> It's interesting, in Acts chapter 19, we see when Paul finally comes to Ephesus in verse 2, it says that, in, at the end of verse 1, it says Paul found some disciples, and in verse 2 it says, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. How interesting that when Apollos came to Ephesus, he had the same problem. He didn't even know if there was a Holy Spirit. He didn't know the fullness and the richness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew about the way. He knew the Old Testament scriptures, but he didn't know everything there was to know about the resurrection and about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so Priscilla and Aquila, they had to teach him. They had to train him. And when Paul comes to Ephesus, he finds more disciples that have the same issue. And you think, if Apollos was there... And Priscilla and Aquila were there, and they were teaching that. Why didn't they teach these disciples? How are these disciples still there that don't know? Well, remember what I said about Ephesus. It was the central hub of the Roman Empire in Asia. It was the capital city. It was enormous. And Paul came from a different route. Remember, Apollos, he came from the south across the Mediterranean Sea. Paul came from the north, from Galatia, and they came into this city. They came into this region from separate ways, and so they met disciples who were spread out all across Ephesus and all across this massive city and this port city. And they met disciples who had the same problem, that they didn't know the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The third thing that I want you to see, children, God uses his perfect timing, God uses whom he chooses, and God uses when when he wills God uses when he wills now this is very similar to God using his perfect timing God uses his perfect timing and God uses when he wills sometimes it's not within God's plan that we do something now how many of you have ever prayed for something specifically and maybe you've prayed for something and, and you thought it was a good prayer. Like you weren't praying for something selfish. You weren't praying for something that, that you really, really thought you needed, but you really just wanted.
But maybe you were praying for something, even from the Scriptures, you were praying for something that you knew was something that God would, would want for you. And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you said, man, God is just not answering my prayer. Has anybody have ever had that? Has, has anybody ever felt like God didn't answer their prayer? Did you know that one of God's answers to prayer is no? Collective gasp, right? One of God's answers to prayer is no. And so sometimes we can pray prayers and sometimes we can, we can really seek God and we can really say, God, why did you allow this to happen? Or God, I really want this or I really need this. Or, or God, I would like to, to minister for you in this way. I feel like I have this gift. God, will you allow me to do this? Will you allow me to be involved in the church? Will you allow me to do this, this thing that I think is going to be so wonderful? God, let me even pray scripture. God, will you give me something that scripture has outlined that, and God says, hmm, no. Or maybe God says, not yet. Now, children, have you ever asked your parents for something that you thought was really good? Like, you went and you said, you know what, I, I really need this. And you think it's just going to be amazing and it's going to be awesome. And again, you're not being selfish. You're not asking for candy or to watch a movie or for something, you know, really weird, right? You're, you're asking for something that you think is going to be really good. And you go to mom and dad and you ask for that and they say, no. Or they say, wait, not right now, maybe a little later. That's the point that I want you to see here is that God uses when he wills. God uses when he wills. And when he's ready to say yes, he will absolutely say yes. He will say yes, now's the time. You know, I haven't always been a preacher. In fact, I, I came upon this through a long journey. Spending my life's career somewhere else in the private sector, doing other work. Doing work that I felt was a ministry, doing work that I felt was, was good and honoring to God, but doing work that wasn't in the pulpit, doing work that wasn't here in the church, doing work that wasn't this. And I always felt called to ministry, but I didn't know what that ministry was. I thought my ministry was going to be here in this private sector. I thought my ministry was going to be elsewhere. And through a number of challenging situations and things where I said, God, why did you allow this to happen, and why did this bad thing take place, and, and now years later, I can look back on it, and I say, you know what, God, had you not me, removed me from that, had you not taken me away from that, had you not allowed those things to happen, I wouldn't be here today, and through all of that, God was preparing me to fill this ministry at this time. Because God uses when he wills. In verses 8 through 10 of chapter 19, it says that Paul spent three months reasoning in the synagogue. He went into the synagogues on the Sabbath day and he went for three months. Time and time again, he would go in and he would reason with the Jews and he would, he would work over all of that with them. Priscilla and Aquila were probably there with him during at least that three-month period of time. They were probably helping him. They were probably ministering along with him. They were t telling him about this man, Apollos. But then after that, the Jews kind of rose up and they, they rebelled against his message. And so he left the synagogue, just like he had in Corinth. He left the synagogue and he went off and he took the disciples with him and he started to teach. And it says that in scriptures that he went to this person named Tyrannus. And he taught in the school of Tyrannus, or maybe your Bible says the hall of Tyrannus. And this was a school type of a building. This was a place where children were being educated or younger people were being educated. But it says very specifically there in the scriptures that he did this teaching from the fifth hour to the tenth hour. And remember, whenever scripture is specific, we need to know why it's specific. 
Children, anybody know what the fifth hour of the day is? 11 o'clock. The fifth hour of the day is 11 a.m. And the tenth hour of the day is 4 p.m. And this was the period of time that Paul would teach in this school, as he would teach from 11 to 4. And you know what's significant about that period of time? That's the period of time that no one would have been in the school. That's the period of time in the middle of the day that they would have taken off because it would have been so hot that they usually went home and they would have their afternoon meal, which was their big meal of the day, and then they would lay down and try to cool off and they would usually take a nap during the middle of the day. And so most of the work and the schooling, most of the activity that went on in the first century, it happened early in the morning and it happened late in the evening when the day was cooler and they could work and they could go to school and they could be educated and they could do those things. But in the middle part of the day, in the hot part of the day, nobody was there. And so Paul went in to an empty schoolhouse. Paul went in to a place that was vacated and he started to teach. And you know what happened? That school started to fill up. People started to come during the hottest part of the day. People started to hear the message and be saved. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, God uses when He wills. Even when it's not convenient. Even when it's hot outside. Even when the internet breaks. God uses when He wills. <clears throat> the fourth thing I want you to see from our text is that God uses what he wants. God uses what he wants. That's your fourth blank on the back of your sheet. God uses his perfect timing. God uses whom he chooses. God uses when he wills. And God uses what he wants. In Scripture, there's this, this amazing story in verses 11 through 20 about how Paul started performing these extraordinary miracles. And you say, well, how did all these people start coming out to the school? Why did they all start coming out? Why did they get out of their ordinary routine? Why did they start coming to listen to this man speak and preach during the day when it was hot outside? And when they would have their meal and when they would be napping? Why would they do this? Well, he started performing these extraordinary miracles, it says. And Paul started to do these wonderful things. And in fact, people would even come and they would take something from him that he had touched, a cloak or an apron or a handkerchief. And even these articles that they would take back to their sick and their ailing family members, those things would heal the people. And so as these extraordinary miracles are taking place, as, as this is happening and as, as Paul is performing these wondrous signs and miracles, people start coming and more and more people start coming and coming and coming to hear the message of Jesus Christ because these great and wonderful things are happening. Even so much so that a couple of people got it into their heads that they were going to cast out a demon. And they said, you know what, Paul is doing this so, so we might as well be able to do it too. So let's give it a try. <clears throat> and these men, they go in, in verse 13, and it says, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirit the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, these men, they didn't actually believe in Jesus Christ. They just saw that his name carried power. And they tried to cast this demon out by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And in Scripture, it tells us this. In verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leapt on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. You see, God uses what he wants to use. But you don't get to use God's power without God being in it. It's not about the thing 
or even the person. It's not about just being able to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, but it's about having Jesus in your heart. I'm not telling you that we should all go out and start blessing handkerchiefs and expecting them to cure cancer. Or go out and start exercising demons. If you want to hear about these miracles and these extraordinary powers that existed in the first century, I preached all about this. I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about this, speaking in tongues and these miraculous gifts. These things were for the first century. These things were for the beginning of the church. These were for the signs and the wonders that needed to happen to get the church going. They're not for today. That's not limiting God's power. I'm not saying God can't do those things. I'm saying that God used them when He chose to use them. Here's the fifth thing. Number five, the fifth fill in the blank. God uses why He uses. God uses why He uses. And this is the one that I think we have the biggest problem with, right? Right? Now, kids, how many of you like to ask why? How many of you like to ask why? Now, when I was a little kid, that was my favorite question. And nobody liked it. None of my teachers liked it. None of my Sunday school teachers liked it. But I was that kid. As soon as they taught a lesson, or while they were in the midst of teaching the lesson, my hand shut up. Why? 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 I wanted to know why. I wanted to understand. I wanted the knowledge. Sometimes, we don't get the answers to the whys. Sometimes there are mysteries. The Bible even talks about that, right? It says the mysterious things belong to the Lord. It doesn't mean that God wants to keep us in the dark. It doesn't mean that, that, we, that there aren't any answers to the wise. In fact, there's a lot of answers to the wise. And we need to, to hunt those out and we need to search for them and we need to ask people. We need to ask our parents. We need to ask our pastors. We need to ask our Sunday school teachers. Don't be afraid to say why. Children, I give you my permission that on the car ride home today, you are allowed to ask why. But that means, that means that you had to listen to something in my message. That means you had to hear something that you wanted to know more about. And when you get the opportunity to ask your parents, you say, Mom, Dad, why did Pastor Matt say this? What did he mean when he was talking about that? God uses why he uses. I want you to turn in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember, I told you that at some point during this three-year period that Paul was in Ephesus, Apollos came back from Corinth. He came back from Corinth to Ephesus, and we know that because of Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians while he was ministering in Ephesus. He wrote this letter to the Corinthian church while he was living in Ephesus after Apollos had come back. Apollos brought news back from Corinth. And here's what Scripture tells us in verses 10 through 13 of chapter 1. It says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
Here in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul addresses disunity in the church. Now it says here that he heard by Chloe's people. Now we don't really know anything about Chloe. The direct Greek translation here means the house of Chloe. It's very likely that Chloe was maybe the, the hostess to Apollos. Maybe when Apollos lived in Corinth, he lived with Chloe. He lived in this household. Maybe all, you know, there, were, there were a number of ministers or brethren that lived there, and they brought word back to Paul in Ephesus. They knew that Paul was in Ephesus at this point. Apollos had gone back to Ephesus. He had reported back. At some point in time, we know that Paul and Apollos, they become friends. They become compatriots. And by the time Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians, he has a acute knowledge. He's well aware of Apollos and who Apollos is. And he writes back to the Corinthian church that you can't be doing this. You can't be divided. You can't be, I'm from Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Peter and I'm of Christ. He said, no, Christ is not divided. You are all followers of Jesus Christ. One of the reasons why some people believe that Paul didn't travel from Ephesus to Corinth directly was because of this letter. The first letter to the Corinthian church was a scathing letter. It was a harsh letter. It was a mean letter. It was honest. It was true. But as you read through the first letter to Corinthians, Paul really let them have it. And he might have been a little bit concerned about how they were going to receive this letter. And so it's possible that he sent Apollos back to Corinth. But Paul, he traveled up through Macedonia and around through Thessalonica and down to Athens before he would come back to Corinth. He went the long way around to wait to get word about how they received the letter. Once he knew how, he, how they received the letter, once he knew that it was received in, in the right spirit and in the right heart, he wrote a second letter to the Corinthian church. And he probably hand-delivered his second letter. He probably took it with him when he went to Corinthian, Corinth. But Paul, God uses why he uses. Here's the last thing I want you to see from our text. The last point is that God uses how he needs. God uses how he needs. When needs arise in the church, God uses who, when, where, why, and how in order to accomplish his will. At the end of chapter 19, there's this great uproar. The idolaters in Ephesus, they're mad at Paul because he's preaching Jesus Christ, he's preaching the true religion, and he's taking money away from them. These people who, were, who made it their livelihood to, to create and fashion these idols, especially the, the idols to Artemis, they were very concerned that their livelihood would be taken away because Paul was preaching and he was being so successful and so many people were converting to Christianity and they're, they're thinking, man, there goes everything that we know and all of our money and all of our income because we make these idols. And if nobody wants these idols anymore because they're all worshiping Jesus, then we're in trouble. So they bring charges up against Paul before the Roman government, and basically the, the government says, we don't want to hear about it. Don't bother us. It's not our problem. Paul wants to go in. He wants to confront this head on. He wants to deal with this. But as we get to chapter 20, and I want to close right here just with two quick verses. In chapter 20, in verse 1, it says, After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. After this uproar, after all of this turmoil, happened and jump down to verse 31 verse 31 still in chapter 20 he says therefore be on the alert remembering that night and day for a period of three years i did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears 
Paul's time in Ephesus comes to a close after three years of ministering with them. After three years of being in their presence, after three years of teaching them the things of Jesus Christ, he decides to take his leave of them because of this uproar, because of God's timing, because of God's perfect plan. He decides to leave Ephesus and go up into Macedonia. God uses his perfect timing. He uses why he uses. He uses who he uses. He uses when he uses. But the point of the entire message, the point of our third missionary journey with Paul is that God can and does still use his people. We're going to enter into our time of communion And as our deacons come forward, I want to read this passage of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As I do each and every month, I read this passage out of 1 Corinthians. This is Paul's first letter to Corinth. This is the, the letter that he wrote from Ephesus. And he says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. We're going to enter into just a time of silent reflection this morning. The communion table at First Baptist Church is open to all baptized believers in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake in communion. We simply ask that you would inspect yourself, that you would judge yourself rightly, that you would come before the communion table in a right manner, in a right heart, as Scripture commands us. Only you know where you stand with the Lord this morning. If there's something that's hindering you from participating in communion, that's all right. Just let the communion plate pass you by. No one's passing judgment. Nobody's going to be looking at you. But as we go into this time of reflection, I just want, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, confess any sins before the Lord that might be keeping you from the table, anything that might be keeping you from being right with the Lord this morning. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Today needs to be the day of salvation. I'd love to speak to you after our service today. Take that to the Lord this morning. However the Lord <clears throat> lays on your heart, would you be in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do praise you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for coming and living a perfect, sinless life, for dying on the cross for our sins, for giving of your body and shedding of your blood so that our sins might be forgiven. Lord God, cleanse us and create in us a new heart so that we might know you ever more deeply. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
at the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus broke the bread and he passed it around to his disciples. And he told them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup and he spoke to his disciples, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant 
drink ye all of it. Now if I could have Brian and Carolyn and Riley join me up here at the front for just a moment. We're going to have uh, lunch immediately following. Come right up here. Turn right around for me. There you go. Uh, we are going to have a, a reception immediately following church right downstairs in our fellowship hall. Um, and so I want to pray and, and bless our food. We wanted to present uh, these three with, with this special gift uh, for their baptism. Um, as soon as I, I finish praying, we're going to uh, uh, sing a, a, a hymn together. And we always do this on Communion Sunday, but we, we will dismiss with the singing of Blessed Be the Tie. Uh, and then we'll enter, exit right downstairs to the fellowship hall. We want to encourage all of you to join us for lunch uh, this afternoon. Please do stay. And uh, you can go right downstairs and, and enter into the line and, and start collecting your food. Uh, I'm going to pray and bless our food here as we close our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this joyous Lord's Day. We thank you, Lord, for these three who have come forward to follow in believers' baptism, Lord, that they would dedicate their lives to walking after you. And Lord, as we have celebrated communion and the remembrance of what you have done for us, the giving of your body and the shedding of your blood so that our sins might be forgiven. Lord, may their example be positively witnessed by all and would more, Lord, follow after their lead. Draw to yourself those whom you have chosen. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.